Well, welcome, and let's jump in. Uh, we're in the series, Revelation, Churches of Revelation. There's seven churches. Today, we're on the sixth church, the church at Philadelphia. Now, that's not Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Uh, that's Philadelphia, Greece. And uh, we're going to jump right in there in just a moment. Philadelphia, you may know, is uh, referred to as the city of brotherly love here in the United States, but that's because that's what the word means. Philo means brotherly love, and Delphus, uh, or Delphia, uh, means city in Greek. And so uh, we get the city of brotherly love. But let's see what God says to the church at Philadelphia in the book of Revelation, chapter 3. We'll begin it at the seventh verse. So go back to the back of your Bible, Revelation chapter 3, uh, beginning at verse 7. Let's read the word of God today. It says this. Oh, stand with me, if you will, as we read the word. Revelation chapter 3, beginning at verse 7. And to the, church of the, and to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, the words of the Holy One, the true one, who has the key of David, who opens and no one will shut, who shuts and no one will open. I know your works. Behold, I have set before you an open door which no one is able to shut. I know that you have but little power, and yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name. Behold, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan who say that they are Jews and are not, but lie, Behold, I will make them come and bow down before your feet, and they will learn that I have loved you, because you have kept my word about patient endurance. I will keep you from the hour of trial that is coming on the whole world to try those who dwell on the earth. I am coming soon. Hold fast what you have, so that no one may seize your crown. The one who conquers, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God, Never shall he go out of it, and I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down from my God out of heaven and my own new name. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Now let's pray. Father, we're thankful, God, that you speak to your church and I'm thankful for your words to the church in Philadelphia, and I pray, God, that those words that you spoke to them some 2,000 years ago would uh, have a, a power to minister to us today as your people and as your church. May we glean truth from this that will help us as we journey through life. I pray, God, for your anointing today. Lord, I want to decrease, but I want you to increase as your word goes forth. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, uh, there's a lot, lot in here, and uh, Philadelphia, a lot of the church, you know, we looked uh, last time at the church in Sardis, and uh, the church in Sardis was a dead church. They had a reputation for being alive, but they were dead, and, uh, and that, that kind of becomes the focus. So some of the churches of the seven churches have a very evident focus uh, when we look at them, and Philadelphia just doesn't seem to have that kind of a focus, but there are certainly some things that are good stuff that's in here. And so let's just walk through some of it. First, he talks about, in verse 7, uh, it talks about who is Christ, who is Jesus. If you have that question, well, here, here's a description, verse 7. The Holy One, the True One, who has the key of David, who opens and no one will shut, who shuts and no one will open. Let me just go through those really quick. The Holy One. He is the Holy One. God is is completely set apart from the sinfulness of this world. He is altogether different than anything that you will find in this world. All right. So when we talk about being a holy people, we're not saying that we have come up with our own holiness that we bring to the table to offer to God. What we are saying is that because God is holy and He calls us to be holy, we are participating in his, who He is, in His nature. And that is to be different, set apart from the world. Uh, so there is a, a, a removal of the things of this world, mindsets and actions and certainly sin, and a dedication to who God is that, uh, in which he sanctifies us in that process. But, but he is the Holy One. He does not sin. He is not sin. He does not abide with sin. He abhors sin. The wrath of God, the Bible says, will be poured out on all sin. Sin is a problem. Sin is an affront to holiness. Sin is the antithesis of what it means to be holiness. 
So holiness is only a problem for those people who like sin. Remember when I hear people say, oh, I don't, I don't like, you know, this all you emphasize holiness or the church emphasizes holiness. And, well, actually, God is the one who emphasizes holiness. He is holy. He is the Holy One. And he's calling us to be like him. And that's his desire, his will, not just ours. Mark chapter 1, verse 24 says, What have you to do with us, Jesus? And now this is the demon speaking. Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Even the demons know who Jesus is. Even the demons know that he is holy. Uh, the angels in heaven, the cherubim, the seraphim, they sing, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. That's the song of worship to him. Say, well, what? why don't they say something nice about it? It's like, well, that's who he is. It's a description of who he is. You can't get better than who he is. Now, some of you, are, if you're married to your spouses, sometimes you exaggerate. You know, I've heard husbands say, you're the most beautiful woman in the world. And I'm thinking, your wife ain't the most beautiful woman in the world. You know, but you don't have to exaggerate with God. Amen. I just got some men in trouble. I know I did. You just said, that preacher, he doesn't know what he's talking about right there. But uh, uh, he is the holy one. It goes on to say, he is the true one. Everything that God says is true. Everything that he does is true. All truth is from him. No truth exists outside of him. What does that mean? That means when you are working on math at school, uh, that those truthful laws of mathematics, I want you to know something, those are things that God created and we have had to discover over time. Uh, when you're in science class, whatever things are fact, not everything that you, did, you learn about is fact. But what things are fact are the laws of nature like gravity and things like that. I want you to know something. Those things are all true and they come from the God of the universe. He is the true one. John chapter 14 verse 6, Jesus said to him, Nicodemus, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. You'll never know what is true and what's real even in, your, even in your own life, if you don't know the true one. You'll live deceiving yourself, living to deceive others, or whatever, it may, whatever might happen. It also says that he is the one who has the key. Well, that's interesting because I've, I've lost my car keys before and I've needed a key. No, that's not what he's talking about. He's not talking about a car key, an access to your vehicle. He's talking about, though, access. A key is always used to access something that is locked or, or uh, uh, that would require a key to get in it. Uh, your vehicle, your door, uh, uh, your office maybe, where you work, uh, they have locks on things and, and, and things. And it's saying here that Christ is the key. Now the, the issue is, what is he the key for? What is he the key for? Two, and it has to do with all that's already talked about. The Holy One of Israel, He's the true one, the Holy One, the true one, and He's got the key. In other words, if you want to participate in the nature of God, if you want to live a life that is holy and that is true and, and built upon truth, then you're going to have to have Jesus because He's the only access to that way of life. He is the only access to that way of life. There's a lot of people searching for contentment and fulfillment in this life, but they're using all the wrong keys. They're using all the wrong keys. I remember I used to work at uh, UPS, and one particular day after work, uh, I, um, I had uh, gone back out uh, to my vehicle, and I, now I worked the early morning shift, and so by the time I got off, usually it was between 7, 8, sometimes 9 if it were, uh, depending on the, the, the season, how busy it was at UPS, but uh, this particular, I was pretty busy, and, and as I was, I was going out to my vehicle, I remember uh, 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 going to get in my vehicle, and uh, my, my truck wouldn't start. I put the key in and turned it, and it wouldn't even turn. It was stuck, and I tried it, and I tried it, and I tried it, and uh, stopped, and then I tried it again, so I, I held down the brake pedal because I thought, well, maybe there's, you know, there's safety mechanisms on vehicles, and held the brake down, turned, wouldn't turn still, and I thought, well, sometimes it's when, you know, have you ever turned your car off, and you turn the steering wheel, at some point it locks up on you, so I thought, well, maybe what's happened is that I've 
put this key in and uh, the steering wheel's locked up and so so i tried to wiggle the steering wheel around to do it that wouldn't work and uh, I, call, I finally got out and there was a co-worker of mine came through i said hey man i cannot get my my, my key to turn in my car and he came over he said well, i don't know much about it and so you know just but he's going to do exactly what i've already done and so he sits in my car he puts the key in tries to turn it can't turn it pushes the brake wiggles the steering wheel takes the gear shifter and kind of shakes it around he's trying everything he knows to do to try to fix the problem of starting the car and you know what the problem was uh that instead of my my the key to my truck i was using the key to my car to try to start it and it wouldn't work and there's a lot of people going through life and they're frustrated and they're, they're agitated and they're discouraged because they're trying the wrong thing. Oh, they might try a little bit of Jesus, all right? Might, might show up at church. I'm not talking about showing up to church. We're talking about Jesus being the key to life for you. That he has access to holy life, to life built on truth, to real abundant life. Jesus is the access to that and we have to embrace it with all that was within us. You want access to real life? You're going to need the right key. And the right key is Jesus. Jesus is the key to life. Write it down. Write it down. Jesus. There's no imitations. There's no generic duplications. No other key will work but Jesus. He's the way, the truth, and the life. There's more to life, though, than just the key, just the, the kind of entry point. In fact, a lot of people believe that, that being a Christian is just about entry points. In other words, once I get the engine started, I go wherever I want to go. I drive that car wherever I want to go. That's access so the, jesus is the key yes he he has the key but goes on to say he's not only the key but he's also the door verse 8 behold i have set before you an open door which no one is able to shut john chapter 10 verse 9 says i am the door if anyone enters by me he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture He's saying, I'm the door. I'm, I'm not only the access, but I'm also the entryway into this real life. Uh, in fact, everywhere along the way, if you're going to live as, as a Christian, you're going to have to deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow him. That means you're going to have to leave everything else behind. Look, to every, Everything else is all, at best, secondary to who Jesus Christ is in your life. Now listen, I can say that till I'm blue in the face as a preacher, and people can say, yep, that's right, preacher. Jesus got to be number one. Jesus got to be number one. But when are you going to make him number one in your life? When are you going to move Jesus up from the back seat to the front seat? So, well, ah, oh, Jesus is the co-pilot of my life. Well, then you got, the, you got a problem because he wants to be the pilot of your life. You need to switch seats if he's the co-pilot, and you need to take the secondary position. Allow Jesus to be not only the access point, but also the door, the key and the door into life. You were created, listen, you were created to have communion with God. We are, we are a people that we're always looking for quick fixes. We want to fix the problem quickly, and move on about our life. I want to get it done quickly. And God's saying, I want to have communion with you. I'm not just your key to fix all your problems, open all the doors so you get all in. I'm the door as well, and you've got to live life through me. Well, my sin gets me in a predicament. What do I want? I want God to bail me out. Uh, I, get, I get, get sick because of sin. God help me. Financial trouble because of sin. God help me. Family problems because of sin. God help me. Lose my job because of sin. God help me. But God's not in the business of saving people from their predicaments, but he's in the business of saving people from themselves. So somewhere along the way, you've got to ask yourself, how did I find myself in this position to begin with? It's because I went my own way. I wasn't utilizing the key and the door and living that life that God had called me to live. Jesus isn't just some kind of an emergency exit. He's not just some kind of an alarm that you pull down and, and he shows up or a genie in the lamp. That God's not your backup plan. Life in the Spirit is all-consuming for those that have been born again and are longing for something more. Jesus, the key, leads to life set apart to God. If he's the Holy One, if he's the true one, and he has the key, then the door that you're walking through is always going to be a door that's leading you to deeper places of holy living. It's just what God's about. It's just what he does. So God doesn't do quick fixes. He's not about just making a quick fix. 
you know, flashing the wand. You go about your business and everything's fine. He does transformation. Now, certainly God can redeem and God has done some things, no doubt about it. But when we view God as that all that he is going to do, he's just a key and he's not the door. He's not the avenue. He's not the life, that, that divine life of walking with God, with Jesus as number one, then we're missing out. See, God has this holistic approach to changing our life. He doesn't want to just change on the outside, not just change our circumstances, but change us within our circumstances so that we would be holy agents and heavenly ambassadors in a fallen world. We're expecting God to change the world around us. Change this guy, man. He meets treatment. He lied to me. Change this scenario. It does not very comfortable for me. I don't like the fact that I have to deal with this in my life. God, could you change it? We're wanting God always to change all the circumstances around us. And God's saying, I'm the holy one. I'm the true one. I have the key. And I am the door. And I want you to understand that I'm about changing your life to the core of who you are. And then you will be an agent of transformation in the world around you. So God doesn't just bail us out of the consequences of sin. What good parent, I said what good parent, just bails their kids out of every little thing that they get involved. Sometimes our children need to suffer the consequences of poor decisions that they've made. All right? And we go bailing them out. What we've done is we've taught them that there aren't consequences to bad decisions. But when they suffer on some level because of the consequences of the decision it's actually a teaching moment and God does the same thing sometimes even though you can be forgiven for your sin there are consequences for it because it is teaching moments to help us understand we can't go doing the same thing over and over again and expect different results God's in the business see of of not taking an apple tree and putting oranges on it but he's, taking, he's about taking an apple tree and changing it into an orange tree so that it bears oranges. It bears new fruit. It's a transformation. So God doesn't just sweep it under the rug. He does a thorough cleansing. He doesn't just paint over rotten wood. He makes all things new. He doesn't put makeup on ugly. He makes things beautiful. He doesn't cover up the problem. He cleanses the heart. He doesn't keep things in the shadows. He brings them to the light. He doesn't associate, uh, associate with sinfulness, but he makes you his son and daughter after you've experienced newness of life. Hallelujah. Now, if you hang around long enough, you'll hear me and us sing about and talk about and teach about. And I hope that every believer in the life of, of, uh, of the body of Christ would talk about things the way the Bible talks about things. In other words, we don't just talk about salvation sometimes, but we talk about full salvation. We don't just talk about uh, forgiveness, but we talk about complete forgiveness. We talk about entire sanctification. We talk about abounding in love and in mercy. We talk about glorious freedom. We talk about perfect peace. We talk about all those kind of things because we believe that God's work is a thorough, full, complete work. He's the Holy One. He's the True One. He has the key and He is the door. And I want you to know that nobody can shut that door. Nobody can prevent you from experiencing what God has has said he desires for you to live in. And so if God says, I want you to be holy just like I'm holy, what he's saying is there is nobody that can stop you unless you choose not to do it. I've got the key. I'm the door. I've got it all. God wants to transform your life. He doesn't want to just patch up a few problems. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord for transformation that he wants to do. Now, there's two kind of extremes as well in here that uh, we can avoid number one you cannot use jesus as the key to getting your way or having your own life so that's self-centered and that's sinful living but you also cannot be content with just living the life but not knowing jesus in other words abiding by a religious lifestyle a moral lifestyle but not really ever having any intimacy with god he's the key and he's the door so the question is can he handle your life? I don't know who all will listen and hear, and, but I know there's a lot of people that you'd say, man, oh man, their life is messed up. How could ever God any, do anything beautiful? How could God do anything redemptive in their life? Well, verse 7 is what we read. It says, 
who opens and no one will shut, who shuts and no one opens. See, he's already doing it. He's already done it in other people's lives. He's redeemed the vilest sinners and transformed their lives. That's good news for you today. That's good news for us all today. That no matter how dark the stain of sin, our God is able because He's one who opens doors and there's nobody can shut those doors. And He's one who shuts doors and nobody can open those doors. He has the ability to do what needs to be done. And it goes on, verse 8, He says, I have set before you an open door which no one is able to shut. In other words, there's an invitation. You to people in the church of Philadelphia, he was saying, you church of brotherly love, I want you to understand I've, op- I've set before you a door. I'm the holy one. I'm the true one. And this doorway leads to me. It leads to deeper places with me. And I want you to understand that I can, I can open these doors of transformation in your lives and you can walk through them by my grace. Now, what's holding you back? What's holding you back? What's keeping you in your seat? What's restraining your spiritual progress from running through that door? From grabbing a hold of the key that is Jesus and accessing transformation of life into the holy life? What's holding you back? A habit? A relationship? Some past harmful experience some situation in your life maybe you're just stubborn about your sin maybe maybe uh the way you've got life you don't want to let go of life as you can do it or maybe you're saying like so many say today i can't do it i don't have the power i can't live like some of the saints of the church i can't live like other people that i've seen around me i just can't do that well the good news is it's not about your power he said in verse 8 i know that you have but little power i know that you do and and you're weak in other words, you don't have what it takes. You can't. But God can. Hallelujah. He is able. Where we are weak, there He is strong. Where we're foolish, where there He is wise. Where we're powerless, there He is powerful. Hallelujah. He is able. In fact, in our weakness, Paul says, in our weakness, His power is all the more evident. Hallelujah. God commends the church at Philadelphia because while they had little power, he said, yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name. You don't have power. You don't have resources. You don't have talent. You don't have money. You don't have all the, whatever the power may have looked like for them and whatever that power might look like for you today. You don't have the background. You don't have the upbringing. You don't have this. You don't have that. And the devil will whisper and tell you every reason why you can't live the life God's called you to live, why you can never experience that kind of transformation, why you can never walk with God. You can never live a holy life. And God's saying, hey, I'm the one that opens the doors. And the devil can't close the door. And when I close the door on your path, I want you to know the devil, it will try to get back in there but he can't open that door because you've been redeemed and you've been transformed hallelujah praise the lord good news there's no sin too big for god to handle matthew chapter 28 verse 18 jesus came and said to them all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me king james it says all power on earth the authority He's saying, it's all been given to me, and guess what he does? He's like, I'm giving it to you to do what? That you'll go, and he gives them the Great Commission, to make disciples. He's the key, he's the door, he has the power. It doesn't get any better than that. He's done it all. He's not a fix-it man. He's the holy one. He's not trying to pull a fast one on you. He's the true one. He's not a God that keeps you at arm's length. Locks the doors. He's the key. And he's the door to life. Would you walk through that open door? Verse 12 in Revelation chapter 3. It says, The one who conquers, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God. Never shall he go out of it, and I will write on him the name of my God. The, oftentimes in that pagan culture, heathen would honor, uh, the heathen people would honor people by putting their names on the pagan temple pillars uh, they put their names on the, on the pillars and even as a child uh you know i looking around the church that i just i just realized growing up uh you could look at people and over time it wasn't that you just had a judgmental attitude but you could pick up that there were there's some people that they're pillars of the church 
They're pillars of the church. We still use that vocabulary. We talk about them. You ever heard somebody say, well, you know, they're a pillar of our community. They're a pillar. That's where, right here in Revelation, that's where we get that from. And my question for you today is, if the key's available, if the door is set before you is open, why aren't you a pillar in the church of Jesus Christ? Well, we don't have much power. Well, neither did the church of Philadelphia, but he commended them because even though they didn't have power, they still obeyed, still sought after him. I don't know about you, but I've just decided I want to be a pillar. I want to be a pillar in the church of Jesus Christ. Would you stand with me today?